Well, good evening, everyone. Good I'm sorry I have to come out of the screenshot right now because I left my Bible down here. All right. Well, thank you for joining us tonight, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook. We certainly appreciate your faithfulness there as well. And those of you that are here, I am very sorry about the smell. <laughs> as you know, as you know, our, our baptistry sprang a leak. It was a bad leak. And, uh, and so when we started contacting people about uh, getting this fixed or whatever, you know, the, 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 the one thing we kept coming across was 13000 for a new one. And, uh, but somebody stepped up and said he thinks he can fix it. And so today he was, he's been working on it since Monday, actually, Monday, Tuesday, and today. And I said, that's the smell. You're, you're smelling the smell of progress. It is the smell of progress. But thank God, because baptisms are important. Amen. That is a biblical mandate. There's a line of people waiting to be baptized, and I'm very excited about it. So pray that this uh, fix works, and uh, it'll be very good. So if you need to leave because it's overpowering, please understand I am not going to be upset or offended by that, And because um, and, I know some people, it's, it's very sensitive to uh, uh, their smell and so forth. All right, please open your copy of God's Word to the book of Ruth, chapter 1, and while you turn in there... Just want to remind everybody that coming this Sunday, Sunday morning, we are continuing our study in the book of 1 John, the book of 1 John. We are in chapter 2. We're doing a verse-by-verse -verse study of that book. And then on Sunday nights, we are doing the seven churches of Revelation. And this Sunday night, we are going to be focusing on the church at Ephesus. Man, I got pictures and, and all sorts of stuff. I, you know, I, I approach it a little differently than I do a, a normal sermon because it's more of a class kind of thing. And, uh, but uh, I'm excited about it and hope you come for it. All right, if you would, let us rise and stand at the reverence of the reading of God's Word. We are in Ruth chapter 1, verse 19. And the Bible says, Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the, very be at the beginning of the barley harvest. Let us pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you so much for your love, your grace, and your mercy. And Father, again, we thank you for this time that we have to come and to open your holy word. Father, I pray that you would uh, bless the reading of it tonight, that you would show us things that we've never seen before. And, and Father, let us, uh, God, just open our eyes to the life of Ruth and, and, and Naomi. And Lord, let's just see, God, what you have in store for us. God, I pray that if there's anyone under the sound of my voice that has never been born again, I pray tonight would be the night of salvation for them. And God, I pray that you put a hedge of protection over this place, remove any evil spirit, anything that would hinder your word and your will from being accomplished. And Father, I just want to die to myself. I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit, that you would anoint my tongue so that my words are yours and not mine own, clear and easy to understand. For we ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people say it. Amen. You may claim your seat. And by the way, you know, usually I have like four and a half, maximum five pages, you know, uh, of notes per sermon. Sunday night is seven. I am not going to be chasing any rabbits. I assure you of that one. But it's going to be exciting. I hope you come Sunday night. It's going to be a lot of fun. Tonight, I want to speak to you on the subject, returning home. As you know, we are doing a verse-by-verse -verse study in the book of Ruth. And Ruth is an amazing person. She is a Moabitess. She is a Gentile. She uh, was at one time an unbeliever and a pagan. And yet, it was this woman that God used to be in the same genealogy as Jesus. Think about that. Very, very interesting. In fact, in fact, David came out of her line. King David came out of her line. We'll talk a little bit about that. And we know that Naomi had left the land of Bethlehem with her, son, with her husband and two sons to sojourn 
in the land of Moab. Now, what we know is that God had brought a famine across the land of Bethlehem. And, and so what happened was uh, 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 Naomi's husband and Naomi and their kids, they, they decided they were going to go to the land of Moab and try to g- find work or food or whatever the case may be. Now, I understand Moab was a l- pagan land. There was no worship of, of Yahweh, of Jehovah there. And, and so, in fact, they, they did everything they could to stop the Israelites and, and curse the Israelites. So they weren't a good people to begin with. And, and instead of owning up to God and, and, and facing what God was bringing upon the Israelites, they decided to leave it and escape it and go to a land where God didn't want them to begin with. So what began as an intended temporary stay turned into more than 10 years of difficulty and heartache. Now, Naomi heard the Lord had visited his people in Bethlehem once again, and so she decides to make the long trip home. See, by the time this is happening, her husband has died, both of her sons have died, and all she has left are her daughters-in-law. And one of them she convinced to go back to her home and be with her family, and the other one she couldn't convince at all, and that is Ruth. And that's who this book is named after. So Naomi had heard, the Lord had visited, so she wanted to return. Now, understand this trip would not be an easy one, but it would be a very beneficial one. But I've I've learned just in my short time of being a human being that sometimes some of the hardest paths are some of the most beneficial paths, you know? You know, you understand that the hard times, we call those times in the valley. When we're in the valley, you understand that that's a time for growth and that's where all the growth takes place, right? You don't see, you don't see grass and flowers growing on the mountaintop. You don't have warm weather on the mountaintop. It is in the valleys. It is in the heat. It is in the furnace. It is in all these things that we grow. And so this trip would not be an easy one, but it'd be a beneficial one. Naomi would have to face the regrets of her past, but she had at least made the decision to go back to her people. Now, as we get into it, I think Naomi's a little hard on herself, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain that in just a little bit. Yeah, look, the bottom line in Naomi was Naomi was faithful to her husband, and her husband made the decision to go to Moab. Okay, so, so I think she's a little hard on herself, but at the same time, it is a picture of what it means to be away from God. And so, and so, uh, so she's made the decision to go back home, to be with her people, to be with her God. She had left with her family with the hope of a better future. But Moab delivered no hope. Not only that, she lost her family in this desolate place. Now she's returning home, broken and empty, but at least she's going home. And she doesn't even know what she's going home to. She doesn't have any land. She, she doesn't even know if, if family is there. She really doesn't know anything. You know what she's doing? She's stepping out on faith and she's returning to God. And that's what it boils down to when we get away from God, right? When we, we as believers, when we get away from God, at some point we need, we need to return home. Because if we don't, we're just going to continue to live in misery. So in this account of Naomi's life, we find many similarities to the parable of the prodigal son. You know, sin is never pretty. And it, and it never brings the results that we thought it would. Sin always, always, always demands a heavy price, does it not? You ever, you ever notice how when sin is enticing you, it looks good, it feels good, everything about it is good, but then when we partake in that sin, what we have is nothing but heartache afterwards. You ever been there? I'm there every time I sin. I'm there. Mm-hmm. And, so, and so now she's heading back home. But there is hope for those who are wayward and away from God. Understand as long as there's breath, there's hope. The only time when there is no hope is when there's death. And then it's too late. Those who are far from home can always return. I've even heard some believers make a statement. They've been away from God for a long time and say, God just won't have me back. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Read the prodigal son. In fact, God is going to meet you halfway. I love that story of the prodigal son, right? When the father sees his son coming in the distance, what does he do? He takes off and runs out. He doesn't wait. He goes after them. 
That's what God does with us as well. There's always hope. So I want to consider this blessed hope that is revealed in this text as we think on returning home. Let's get into our text. When we come to verse 19, we see the town of her return. We see the town of her return. In the first part of verse 19, it says, Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. Now Bethlehem was a very special place. It had so much to offer to the child of God. So let's take a moment. Let's examine the atmosphere in Bethlehem, okay? The atmosphere at this particular time in Bethlehem. First of all, it was a place of exaltation. It was a place of exaltation. You see, Bethlehem was in the land of Judah and was often referred to as Bethlehem Judah. The word Judah simply means praise. Very simple. Judah means praise. This was a place where the Lord was honored. Bethlehem Judah. Bethlehem praises God. This was a place where God was honored. It was, it was a place where he was worshipped. It was a land where God was recognized as the true and the living God. Bethlehem was a city where God was praised. You know, a lot of interesting fellows came out of Bethlehem, did they not? You know, the main one we can think of is, of course, David. Bethlehem is the city of David. David was born there. But who else was born there? But Jesus... Jesus was born in Bethlehem. It was a beautiful, it's still a beautiful place. Bethlehem was a city where God was praised. Now, we find no record of a tabernacle like the Jews had in Jerusalem anywhere in the country of Moab. No, there's no evidence in archaeology or history that would dictate that there was any kind of temple, any kind of synagogue or anything in the land of Moab. We find no record of any public worship. You know what this is? Moab is a picture of the world. So when you think of Moab, think of the world. Think, think of a place where no one worships God. God is not honored. God is not praised. Seems to be a lot of countries nowadays like that, huh? Hmm? It's a place where God was recognized. The world offers very little praise to the Lord. In fact, the world does not even recognize Him as God. And they certainly do not desire to worship Him as God. I like to be around those who desire to praise the Lord, don't you? I do. I love being around those people. They just have this oozing desire that seems to come out of every pore in their body to want to give God praise and want to give God worship. You know, I've met people like this all my life where you would never think they'd have a bad day. And you know they have bad days because we all have bad days, amen? But I've come across people who so walked with the Lord that they ooze the Lord out of their pores. They praise God even in the midst of the storm. They praise God not only on the mountaintops, but they praise God in the valley, man, and they just oozed, oozed God. God. I like to be around those people. In fact, I want to be in a place. I want to be in a place where God is worshipped, where God is honored. That's one of the things I saw here, you know, when, when I came here, when, when uh, my, my interview and all that stuff, when I come here and saw everybody, you know, this church was packed out that day. I remember, you know, and, and, and I just loved the atmosphere. I did, you know. I can't tell you every church I've ever preached in, I felt that way, especially churches where I went in view of a call, you know. Uh, you, there were just some places I've, I've been in where I couldn't wait to get out. That should never be the case. That's why I like it when people hang around and fellowship after church. Man, you think I have a problem with that? No. Fellowship, man. Have a good time. This is Lord's house. We should be able to fellowship with the Lord's people. If I got to get to bed, I'm locking up. Just turn out the lights on your way out, okay? So we see that it was a place of exaltation, but it's also a place of visitation. It's a place of visitation. Now to see this, we actually have to go back to verse 6. Verse 6 says, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. You see, Bethlehem was a place where God visited his people after his judgment. Remember, there was a famine in the land because God was bringing judgment into the land. There was sin that had been going on, sin that had not been dealt with. People did what was right in their own eyes. Man, does that, does that not sound like the world today? You know, 
You know, we keep asking God to bless America, but you know what? I haven't asked God to bless America in a very long time. Number one, he can't bless sin. You know, what do I pray for? Do I pray for the leaders? Yeah. Do I, do I pray that there's a harvest in the land? Yeah. Do I pray that there's a revival? Yeah. But we don't see a lot of that, do we? You will never find that in the world either. God may come to one who is wayward and backslidden in conviction and rebuke, but he will not visit you with his power and glory. Sometimes God will withhold his hand upon us when we are living in open sin. You understand, we, we enjoy the blessings of God, especially when we are in service to God, when we are in God's will, but when we get outside of God's will, he sort of takes his hand off just a little bit to let us experience the consequences of our actions. Mm-hmm. You know, he did this with the Israelites. Remember during the times of Judges? Man, they, oh, look, look, they got a king over here. Look, God, they got a king over here. God said, you don't need a king, you've got me. <laughs> You would think that would have been enough to convince them, you know? No, no, no. So God said, okay, but you'll regret I'm going to give you what you asked for, but you're going to regret it. Folks, be careful what you ask for. Be very careful. You might get it. See, it's a place of visitation. We see that Bethlehem is a place of provision. Remember, Bethlehem means house of God or house of bread, I mean. Naomi had left Bethlehem because of famine in the land. She had made her way to the wasteland of Moab with her husband. And to her disappointment, there was no real provision in Moab. You know, they say grass always looks greener on the other side. There's truth to that. There's a lot of truth to that. But bread also isn't always physical. What about spiritual bread? In the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 35, And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. We cannot look to the world and expect to be fed. Bethlehem means house of bread. Remember, it was a place where they praised. It was a place where they worshiped. And where two or more are gathered, the Bible says there he is in the midst of them. Right? Right? And so we're seeing this hmm, as a place of provision. And if you're interested in being fed by the Lord and receiving what you need for your soul, then you must abide near the Lord. You cannot expect God's blessings and God's hand in your life when you're away from Him. It's just not going to happen. He's going to let us go. Man, God is a God of grace. You know, he'll let us go. Those of you parents, you understand that, right? You know, we're always looking out for our kids, and we're never, we're never going to allow harm to come to them, right? But sometimes a situation may come up where we may just let them go. All right, go ahead. See how that's going to work. And, and, and what happens is they go and they do something, whatever the something is, and they realize it wasn't what they wanted or the results weren't what they wanted, and they learned a lesson the hard way. Why is it? Why is it that we are hard-headed individuals and sometimes have to learn the hard way? Y'all been there? <laughs> Man, you know? It would be so much easier if I would just trust God the first time <laughs> instead of trying to do things on my own and getting outside of the will of God. Because sometimes God lets you go, man, and, and you'll pay for it, you know. I, the biggest one for me is when we bought that ugly neon, that ugly Plymouth Chrysler neon, whatever it was. It was a Dodge neon, that's what it was. Blurple. It was, it was blue. Next to a purple car, and it's purple next to a blue car. So it was blurple. It was ugly as sin. I can't. (laughs) I can't. And God told us both. God told us both, don't do this. Oh, yeah, God, we can can do this. We got this. (laughs) 
You ever, you ever wonder what God thinks when we say, we got this, God, you know? God, we got this, man. We didn't have that car. I can't remember, but it was less than six months. It was less than six months, man. Just ruined financially. It just, man, it wrecked us. It was like God said, I told you. And you know what? I learned a very valuable lesson the hard way. I've never made that mistake again. Imagine that. Man, when God says no, we better listen. <laughs> There's a reason he's saying no. Oh, man. And not only, not only was it a place of provision, but it was a place of association. Bethlehem was a place where people of God dwell. Even today, there is a large percentage of, the, the, the percentage of Christians in Bethlehem is larger than the rest of the area. Even today, there's a large population of Christian believers. We found that he visited his people there. Naomi, Naomi did not enjoy the fellowship and the encouragements of God's people while in Moab. And guess what? When we are out in the world and we're not leaning on God and we're not leaning on God's people and, and having the influence and the structure and the support of God's people, understand you will never find that in the world. You'll never find that in the world. And we know that, right? Those of us who've been at church for any amount of time, how many times have you come to church not really wanting to be at church? And then after you got to church, man, God just really blessed you. And by the time you left, you're like, oh, I'm so glad I came. You ever been there? Many times. And I'm the pastor. <laughs> just see if y'all are awake. Just see if y'all are awake. <laughs> you know, there's something special about God's people. There just is. There is help, there is encouragement among the church that is found nowhere else. You know one of the things that I love about this church, at least the majority anyway, is that this is one of the most non-judgmental churches. Now, are there judgmental people in churches? Yes, of course. They're in every church, they're in every place, of course. But some churches are just judgmental in their theology. That's not the case here. It's not. I'm certainly not that way, and, and, and there's a few individuals I'm sure that are that, are that way just because they're not, they haven't reached a spiritual maturity in their lives, and that's okay. There's time for them to grow in that as well, you know, but there's just something about being able to come to church and say, look, we're in this war together, and I'm just a little bit battle-weary. Would you mind taking a couple of shots while I close my eyes for just a moment? That's spiritual warfare, and we can not do this alone, can we? We can't. That's why, you know, listen, listen you know, you know, the Bible says confess our sins one another. Now, don't take that to extreme and stand up and start, you know, throw, doling out your dirty laundry. That's not what that means. But it does mean if you're struggling in some place, go to a Christian brother and say, I confess to you, I'm struggling in this area. You know, I'm struggling in this area. Would you pray with me? Would you, would you help me be accountable in this area? Because if you ask me, I'm not going to lie to you. I make a covenant that I will not lie to you. And if you ask me, I have to tell you under the authority of the word of God. And that person who was asked upon should never look down in condemnation of that person because if it were not for the grace of God, there go I. Right? It's a place of association. Bethlehem was that way. Church is that way. It should be that way. Attending worship services and fellowshipping with the saints, in my estimation, according to the Bible, is essential if we are to maintain a right relationship with God. You know, even Hebrews tells us, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves as some, as the manner of some. You know, some who, you know, they call church organized religion. I have nothing to do with organized religion. No, you're just telling me that you don't want to follow what God has laid out. You know, you, you know what following God means? It means dying to ourselves. It means saying, it's no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who lives within me. And God, may I be your eyes, may I be your feet, may I be your hands, may I be your mouthpiece, may I be your heart. Rest of verse 19 and verse 21, we see the testimony of her return. We see the town of her return. Now we see the testimony of her return. I love Wednesday nights because it feels like a lecture hall in class, but that makes time go by really, really fast. So let me put my phone there so I know what time it is. We see the testimony of her return. As Naomi returned to Bethlehem, 
She was recognized. Hmm? Last part of verse 19, And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the, woman said, and the women said, Is this Naomi? I've been to many churches where somebody had been a big part of the church, maybe their family's a big part of the church, or whatever the case may be, and, and somebody comes home after a very long time. You know what I've never seen in any of those instances in my 32 years? I never saw where some other believers said, get out of here, we don't want you here. No, they always embraced them. We've missed you. It's so good to see you. Man, yeah, that's, that's how church should be, right? You know, sometimes so what I've learned as a pastor is sometimes people who have been out of church for a very long time, they try to avoid me because they think that I'm going to, you, you know, uh, uh, put the gauntlet on them of why they're not in church and they shouldn't be. You know, I never mention that. I purposely don't mention that to them. You know, I say, look, I hope, I hope I see you Sunday. But I never mention that they're gone or been away. No, why? Because I want to know that they're welcome here. And I make it a point in this church that when somebody comes in, they haven't been here for a while, I make it a point to go back there. Oh, it's so good to see you. It's, it's a big deal. I'm not faking it. It's a big deal for somebody to come back because it takes a lot of guts Amen. to come back sometimes. And they need to be supported in that. Amen? Yeah. We see the testimony of a return. So as the people gathered around, Naomi spoke of God. In verse 20, she said, but she said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. When she left Bethlehem, the famine was, uh, the famine had emptied her stomach. And as she returns, the loss of her family has emptied her hands of every blessing that God has given to her. And right now, she cannot see the blessing of Ruth, but she will. Because God's redemption is real. And in somewhat of a melodramatic display, Naomi demands people to refer to her by a new name. Naomi literally means pleasant and lovely. Your names meant something back then. And, and, and her name means pleasant and lovely, but she didn't feel that way anymore. So she said, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. Well, Mara in the Hebrew means bitter. She's calling me Mara because the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. She is still referred to as Naomi throughout the story, but she believes that God has given her nothing but bitterness, and so that is how she identifies herself. Now, we're on this side of it, and we see a different picture, don't we? We see that she is a daughter of Zion. She is a child of God. And if one thing we know about Scripture, Scripture tells us this, and Jesus said, I will never leave you and never forsake you. Right? What I have experienced from those who have gotten away from the Lord, especially if it's been decades, now I'm not talking about somebody for a couple of months. You know, sometimes we get away from the Lord for a couple of months, we'll come back, you know, it just it happens sometimes. But I'm talking about those who have been away for decades. And their life is miserable and things did not work out the way they wanted to. And they say, man, I brought all this on myself. This is, this is God dealing bitterly with me. But is it? Or is it that we are just suffering the consequences of our own actions? We tend to blame God sometimes when things go wrong, but are they wrong because of God? Are they wrong because of sin? Are they wrong because of our thoughts or whatever the case may be? But we can always know that God is never wrong. So she says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. She said, the Almighty. Now the Hebrew word there for Almighty is El Shaddai. Naomi does not use Yahweh. Okay? It's very important that she said the Almighty, which is El Shaddai in Hebrew, she did not say Yahweh. Right? Yahweh is the personal name of God given to the Jews as part of His covenant with them. Almighty reflects God's power, it reflects His sovereignty, and also mystery. Is God not a mysterious God to you? He certainly is to me. Even the Bible says His ways are not our own. 
Sometimes God does things, and I'm not sure what he's doing until later on I see the end result. I, oh, okay. <laughs> you ever had disappointments in life only to realize that it was God blocking ways for you, leading you in a particular path, and when you get there, you're like, oh, man, I could have never experienced this if this happened down here and this happened down here, you know? <laughs> man, God's amazing to me. He's, he's just so amazing to me. So Naomi realized that her time in Moab had come at a great price. She had walked away from Bethlehem, a place where God had dwelt, and she had made her home in a worldly land. She had abandoned the ways of God for the ways of the world, and because of disobedience, she believes that God has dealt with her very bitterly. But God hasn't dealt with her bitterly. She just feels that way. And I understand that because I, I've, I've come across many who felt that way. Maybe I've felt that way a time or two in the past. I'm like, God, this is just, this just doesn't seem right. I don't understand what is, I don't understand what is happening. And every time God is like, just trust in me. Just trust me. Just trust me. And I've learned that when you and I, when we put our faith and trust in God, He always comes through. Every time. God, and so, and, so, and so she had abandoned the ways of God. She felt that God had dealt with her bitterly. And there is a profound truth for all of us to see here. God did not condone or overlook sin in the life of Naomi, and He will not overlook it in our lives as well. He is a God of holiness. And when we choose to abandon the ways of God for the lure or the lust of the flesh, then we can rest assured that God will deal with us regarding our sin. In fact, some lived lives that were full and very abundant, and now they are empty spiritually. It is serious to walk away from the Lord and live only to please the flesh, because if we do that, we're never going to find joy. We're never going to find happiness. And guess what, friends? We will never find peace. You understand, peace is found when we're living in the center of God's will. That's where it's found. You can be in the midst of the storm and have complete peace, right? You can have complete. You ever, you ever experienced that complete peace? There's one area that God showed me a long time ago that I, I've, it's just, I, I can never forget it. I can never forget it. I can lose everything, right? I can lose my life. I can lose my health. I can lose my job. I can lose all sorts of things, but there's one thing I cannot lose. I can't lose my salvation. And there is a peace about that. I'm not worried about where I'm going when I die. I know where my home is. Huh? And I don't need a key to get in that room. Hmm? Well, yeah, I do. The key just happened to be Jesus. <laughs> right? And so we see this profound truth. In verse 21, she says, I went out full and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi since the Lord has testified against me? Part of her resentful story is to point out the irony of the predicament. You see, when she left Israel, Naomi's belly was empty because she had no food, yet poetically speaking, her hands were full because she had family. I understand that. You know, when Miss and I first got married, first year, I made $3,000 that year. Together, we made $3,000 that year. Together. How do you survive on $3,000 a year, right? And, and, and we were just married and, and falling on these, on these hard times. But I can look back and tell you, God is my witness that we never fretted it. We didn't, we didn't go out to restaurants, man. We didn't do anything like that, man. We had nothing. We had nothing. But I had my wife. And that was all I needed. I, I had my wife. How many people who have all the money in the world and yet are lonely? What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, loses his own soul? 
Empty. Empty here means with empty hands, okay? Or without a gift. I left my belly full. I, can't, my, I left my belly empty. Now I come with empty hands. She's saying, I, I'm without gift. You see, God tells the Israelites that certain events require a sacrifice and they do not, and, 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 and they may not appear empty handed before the Lord. Now you can read about it in Exodus chapter 23 and verse 15, also in chapter 34 and verse 20. So they couldn't go empty handed. At times, he, always, he also promised to fill their hands, such as when they left Egypt. And when an Israelite releases an indentured servant, the master is to supply that servant with what he needs. He is not to leave empty-handed. You know, one of the things a youth minister shared to me years ago, and I never forgotten it. He said, you know, our children should never leave empty-handed. I never got that until I started studying this. I never got that until I started studying this. How do you approach God now? How do you approach God? How has God blessed you? You understand that one day as believers, you and I will stand before the Lord, and I've shared with you before, my fear is that I will appear empty-handed. You know, we're going to get five, one of five different crowns, possibly all five. I doubt any of us in here will have a martyr's crown. There's five crowns, and you're not going to keep them. You're not going to put them in a shadow box. You're not going to put them on the, on the mantle. You're going to lay them at the feet of Christ. You will give your rewards. We will give our rewards back to Jesus. And for all he has given me, I never want to return to him empty-handed. And I want to be able to lay those, those crowns at the feet of Jesus. So in Revelation, when he comes back at the second coming, the Bible says he'll be wearing many crowns. Where does he get them? From us, giving them back to him. Man, I don't want to be empty-handed. So the Lord speaks about it. So she's come and saying, I have nothing. I'm empty-handed. Naomi feels that by allowing, her husband, uh, uh, by allowing her husband and sons to die, that God has somehow suggested to others that she is guilty and she should be punished. But the truth of the matter is Naomi has really done, she did nothing wrong to begin with, but she did stay there for a long time, even after her husband died. So there's some guilt there. What Naomi is too hurt to realize, at least for now, is that God's work in her story simply isn't finished. Her daughter-in-law's role in this particular saga has just begun. We haven't even begun to get into the good stuff in Ruth yet. And the women who try to comfort her now, will, in chapter 4, will be praising her. Will be praising her and praising Ruth as being more valuable than ten sons. There's a great thing coming. There's a great thing coming. Verse 22, we see the time of her return. Now, this is very interesting here. We see the time of her return. In verse 22, it says, So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they, be, now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So we find that Naomi returned at the beginning of the barley harvest in Israel. Now, this was a very special time that has wonderful application for us as well. First of all, barley harvest was a time of sacrifice. A, it was a time of sacrifice. The Bible reveals in Leviticus chapter 23 that the Passover was held at the beginning of the barley harvest. If y'all can't already see it, I'm going to have to explain more. Passover was celebrated at the remembrance of the lamb that was slain and his blood applied to the doorposts and, and, and so forth and the lentil with God passing over them, shielding them from death. Now, 
This is a wonderful, wonderful picture of the sufficiency of the sacrifice that was made. Blood was shed and atonement was received. That's what happened at Passover. Remember, God was bringing the judgments against Pharaoh and Egypt, and, and, and he was going to come in with the death angel, and he was going to take the firstborn out of every household that did not have the blood applied to the doorpost and the lentil. And sure enough, that night when, when a, that death angel passed over and there was no blood on that doorpost, man, that death angel would go in there and take the firstborn. Even if dad was the firstborn of his family, guess what? He's dead too. Some believe, and I don't, know, I, I don't know the veracity of this, but some believe that King Tut, the boy king, died during this time. That's how he died. Now, I, don't, I don't know how much that is true or not. I don't know the veracity of that, but I've heard that and I've read that in, in a couple of places. And so, and so that's what Passover is all about. And the, and the barley, har barley harvest always happened right at the beginning of, of Passover. So what hope, does that, what hope that gives us today? Think about it. The blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary was the sacrifice that God used to bless us, right? And it was sufficient to cover all sin. We may stray from the Lord and even miss His mark, but we can be forgiven and cleansed through the blood that was shed. And that's sort of the picture we have here. Passover was getting to happen. What's, what is the big deal of Passover? That's where the blood was shed for the Day of Atonement. Not, not, not Day of Atonement, but on Passover. And, and so the blood was shed for the remission of sins for all of Israel for that year. But it is also a picture of Christ dying on the cross. Do you know when Christ died? Passover. Passover. And when we apply that blood, even when we get away from the Lord and we're not serving the Lord and we're not worshiping the Lord, you understand the blood is still applied. And it allows us the opportunity to confess our sin and to come back to Him. And God takes us with open arms every time. That's the blessing of them coming in right at the beginning of the barley harvest because that was Passover. It pictured redemption. What is the theme of Ruth? Redemption. It is not an accident that she came back at the beginning of the harvest. It was a time of sacrifice. It was also a time of security. During the barley harvest, God's people also celebrated the first fruits, the Feast of First Fruits. So here's how it works. You've got the Feast of Passover. Immediately following Passover, the next day is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay. After that was the Feast of First Fruits. Okay? All of them represent something. By the way, Passover represents Calvary. Feast of Unleavened Bread represents the sinless Messiah in the grave. And the Feast of First Fruits represents the resurrection. Do you know when Jesus was put in the grave? Guess what? It was on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Do you know when he came out of the grave? Oh, yeah. It was the Feast of First Fruits. Hmm? Do you know when the Holy Spirit came? At the very next feast, Pentecost. People think Pentecost was just the time when the Holy Spirit came down. No, Pentecost is a feast. It's a feast in Leviticus 23. There are no, there are no uh, feasts during the summer because why? Summer represents the church age. What's the very next feast? Feast of Trumpets. We call it Rosh Hashanah. Okay? I believe that the rapture is going to happen on the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah. I believe, why would God change his pattern at this point? He's not going to, right? Now, Kevin, you can't say that. The Bible says no man knows there they are. You're right. I don't know which Rosh Hashanah it is. This year it's in September. It's, it's right at the beginning of our Bible prophecy conference. There's a chance we won't be having a Bible prophecy conference. <laughs> and I'll be okay with that, by the way, you know. And, 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 and it's, it's a feast that lasts for two days. It's never the same time at every place in the world. Right now, it's 734 Central Time. It's, it's like 7 o'clock in the morning over in the Philippines right now. So it's never the same. You're right. I don't know the day because it's on either two days, and we don't know which year it's on, so I don't know the day, and I don't know the hour. I can't say he's coming at noon Central Time. But the Bible says, Jesus even said, you can know the seasons, right? 
He said, you can know the seasons. What does he mean by seasons? He doesn't mean spring, summer, fall, and winter. He means feasts. So if you understand the feasts, you understand the season. Isn't that cool? That is so cool. I got to move on. I'm going to be here all night. It's time of security. Okay. So during the barley harvest, God also celebrated the feast of first fruits. This was a time where the priest, the high priest, would take a sheaf of the first of the harvest. Okay. You know what a sheaf looks like? It's kind of the uh, uh, conical. Uh, what are those things at Thanksgiving time? Cornucopia. I sort of see it like a cornucopia, you know, kind of that style. I could be totally wrong in this too, but that's how I see it. And, uh, and, and so they would come with the sheaf of the first of the harvest and they would wave it before the Lord. So they would take this Harley, barley and he would, he would put it in a sheaf and this, this priest would wave it before the Lord. And what it was, it was a promise. It was a promise that not only will God uh, get the first of our fruits, but it was God's promise to us that he would bless all the harvests after that. It was called the wave offering. This was done in thanksgiving for the harvest that the Lord had provided in anticipation for more to come. The Feast of First Fruits was viewed as a time of new beginnings, of renewed hope. And surely Naomi rejoiced in her heart at this time. See, life had been very difficult and been very devastating for her, but there was hope for a new beginning and there was an anticipation of a future blessing. You see, when a wayward child comes home, it is always, always a time of rejoicing. Always. It's a time to begin anew. And look forward. And, and by the way, I would even apply this to the sinner who comes to know the Lord. You understand that's a time of rejoicing. It is. I love it when the church gets excited when someone gets saved. Hey, man, how? Yeah, do that. They're doing it in heaven. <laughs> it says, the Bible says the, the angels in heaven rejoice when one comes to know God. Surely we should rejoice too. We should rejoice not only when somebody gets saved, but we should rejoice when somebody comes home. It should always be a time of rejoicing. We see that it was also a time of sufficiency. It was a time of sufficiency. Now, do you remember why Naomi left Bethlehem? Well, there was a famine in the land. The people were very hungry. And I realized that she looked in all the wrong places to find what she needed. But the fact remains that she left hungry and returned in a time of plenty. It's very important to see that. The harvest was now ready. God had blessed with abundance and she should be there to enjoy his blessings. She's in the right place. She's come home. She's come home, but she still hasn't experienced that, that, that assurance of redemption that she has, but she will. She will. And you may be struggling today. Maybe you're listening on YouTube. Maybe you're listening by CD. Maybe you're listening on Facebook or watching on Facebook. If you're watching, I'm so sorry, you got to see this. But if you're watching on Facebook, if you're, if you're doing any of these things, understand, understand that, that God is here for you and God hasn't left. And if we feel that God has left, understand that God never left. If we feel God has left, God has it. It's because we left. What's the story about the couple in the truck? The couple in the truck driving down the road. They've been married for several years and they pass another truck coming in the opposite direction. You remember the old bench seats and trucks? Your girl could slide over to you and, and sit next to you, you know? My first truck was like that. And I missed him. I remember. And you know, she, she would get, oh, yeah. I still got it, y'all. Still got it. <laughs> and, 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 I, and, and so the story goes, is this, this old couple, they were driving down the road. They saw another truck coming the other direction. And, and saw this couple that were sitting close to each other like that. And she looked over and realized she was way over here on this side. He was way over on that side. He said, he said she said, honey, look, look, look at that. We used to do that. He said, well, who moved? It wasn't the driver. If you feel God has left you, who moved? It wasn't God. God has always been there. In fact, the Bible says God will never leave you or forsake you. 
He's always there. But sometimes we get, so, we get so caught up in our sin and so caught up in the darkness that we just can't see what is in front of our face. That's intentional. The devil wants to make it dark. He doesn't want you to see the light. But here's the thing. The darkness cannot overcome the light. It cannot. Wherever light is, you'll see it. Even so, you know, you look up in the star, the sky, and you see all those stars. You understand the stars are just like our sun. And they're billions of miles away in the blackness of space, but we can see it clear. That's so cool to me. Last, it was a time of surrender. It was a time of surrender. As Naomi returned, she wanted to be known as Mara. She believes that God has dealt bitterly with her. Mara means bitter. Again, I don't view this, I don't, I don't view this as an attitude of bitterness on her sake. I view this as a matter of repentance on her part. She feels the Lord has dealt bitterly with her, so she has returned home. So she's not coming from a place of bitterness. I believe she's coming from a place of repentance. And I think we'll see that in the, in the coming verses in the next coming weeks. I think we'll see that. So I don't view it as, as, as an ad, attitude of bitterness. She had tried it on her own, and it resulted in failure and defeat. And now she, re, she has resigned to the ways of God. Whatever that may be. Some of the most interesting times in my life is when I would finally let go of something and say, okay, God, I give up. Y'all ever been there? Whether it was because of some obedience, some calling in our lives that we've been running from. And I ran from the ministry for a while, for a while so I understand that, right? And so, it, so sometimes you get that. And I lost my train of thought. I have no idea where I'm going on that. No wonder I got three minutes left. Let me move on. <laughs> See, Lord's, Lord's keeping me in time right here. That's what I'm going to tell myself anyway. So she wanted to be known as Mara. And so she came. So she's coming back, right? She's resigned to the ways of God. And I've been there. I've been there. I'll share with you. I've been there. And so it's not only with a call, but sometimes it's with sin. You ever, you ever fought God with a sin in your life, and it finally came to the point where you gave up and said, okay, God, that's it. I got to give up this sin. So it could be because of disobedience of your call, or it could be disobedience because of sin. But eventually, a believer, if it comes to it, it should come to the place where they do surrender and say, God, I give up. I, I know you, whatever, whatever you do with me, that's what you'll do. I'll close with this story. I was saved April 11th, 1989. Moved to Georgia, December of 1989. I met my wife in January of 1991. Met her there. We were married in June. We were doing well as well as any you know, newly married couple can do. And you don't have a lot of money. You know, we, were doing, we were doing okay. But the truth of the matter is, I was backslidden. I was going to church. I even did a gospel radio show on Sunday mornings at a country radio station. It was country all week, but on Sunday mornings, they had God, Southern Gospel from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. And I was even doing this gospel show at the time, but I was away from God. And we got married and and Misty, I used to uh, manage a business, and Misty was my assistant, and, and I lost my job because I lost my job. She lost her job, and we, we left Georgia and moved to this small town called Melrose, Florida. You'd never heard of it. You know her? Okay. Well, yeah, it's down where Interlocking is and, and, and Keystone and all that, right? And so, and so we moved to a place out there that didn't even have... You know, didn't have indoor plumbing. The shower was on the outside of the house. Didn't have any AC. Didn't have any heat. We had nothing. We had no money. We had nothing, nothing, nothing. It was poverty. I, and, and even though it was st still God blessed us. But I was riding down the road. I was riding down the road, and I was listening to a Gold City song. Now, I cannot tell you to this day what the song was or what, it, what message it had, but whatever it was, Man, it just 
It fell on me like a ton of bricks, man. I'm driving down Blanding Boulevard, and, and so I, I pull off to the side of the road because I'm just crying profusely, man, just crying, crying, because I know I've been away from God for so long, and God had been dealing with me. And, and you know what? I remember, just like I'm talking to you right now, I remember sitting on the side of that road, and I called out to God. I said, God, I, I've sinned against you, and I'm coming back. And Lord, I'm so sorry for the way I have been, the things that I have done. And I made a promise with God. I said, God, even if I never hear from you again, I'll serve you. And I meant it. I meant it. And you know what? I didn't hear from God for weeks. I think God was testing me. Not for his sake, but for mine. And I surrendered to the Lord that next Sunday. I surrendered, man, because I've been running from God, you know. I surrendered that Sunday morning. I said, God, I'll serve you with all my heart, all my mind, and all my soul. Am I perfect? No. Do I make mistakes? Yeah, I still make bad choices. But you know what? God, instead of taking me out of this world, he wrapped his loving arms of grace around me, and he kissed me with his lips of mercy, and I'm standing before you now as a man who only has God to lean on. And you can lean on him too. Let's stand and let's pray. <laughs> Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you so much for your love, your grace, and your mercy. Father, and I want to pray for any individual that's under the sound of my voice or individuals, God, who may be struggling, maybe they're struggling with sin, maybe, maybe they're running from you. God, whatever the case may be, Lord, I pray God, that you would just wrap your arms of grace around them, that they would come to you in repentance and surrender. And Father, they would just sell out to you with all their heart, all their mind, and all their soul. And Father, I pray for any person who has never been born again, that has never been saved. Father, I pray that right now would be the time of salvation for them. Father, they would repent of their sin and call upon you to be Lord and Savior of their life. Father, I pray that we would have a burning desire in our hearts to see lost souls saved and, and, Father, a burning desire to be obedient to you. Lord, we love you. Please bring us back at the next appointed time. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us online. Hope to see you Sunday, 845. Until then, have a great week.